class, this is Babu Dan again, specifically discussing anatomy and physiology of the lungs as it relates to respiration physics. Respiration physics mostly involves gas flow in and out of the bloodstream. We know that oxygen drives cellular metabolism and the byproduct produced is carbon dioxide. The blood transports both oxygen and carbon dioxide as dissolved gases. The lungs provide the gas-liquid interchange to and from the atmospheric air, and there are a number of physical laws that govern that exchange that are really important to know. The lung anatomy and physiology optimize the gas-liquid exchange based on those physical laws. Supplemental Supplemental oxygen only increases the O2 concentration, whereas ventilation can also improve uh, removal of carbon dioxide. So physics determines physiology, and the reverse is true also. The physics of gas exchange is what determines lung anatomy. Lung anatomy and physiology determine therapeutic device physics. So first we have to understand the physics goal of respiratory anatomy, uh, starting with the way uh, laws govern the gas liquid exchange in the lungs. We need to understand the rate factors affecting oxygen absorption and carbon dioxide emission, and that will help us understand the roles of oxygen therapy devices for improving that exchange in patient therapy. So there are three stages of gas exchange in human respiration. The first is breathing, which is the actual interchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen with the bloodstream. The second is the bloodstream itself, the circulatory system. And finally, the metabolic mechanisms for exchange of gases at the cellular level and receiving tissues. So the act of breathing is to contract the intercostal muscles between the ribs and the diaphragm during inhalation. And what this does is expand the lungs. And by doing that, it's creating a negative pressure gradient so that air is actually sucked into the lungs. Now, normally exhalation is just a relaxation of those muscles. Although it is possible, of course, to expel air forcefully which we do when coughing, shouting, singing, or first breathing. So breathing is normally an automatic autonomous action that does not require our conscious control. And for obvious reasons, we need to be able to breathe at night uh, when we're unconscious uh, and in any condition. The drop in a blood alkalinity becoming more acid is an indication that the blood has too much carbon dioxide. And that uh, change in pH is measured by various control devices and it, that directly can affect the rate and the depth of breathing. So here we have sort of an enhanced pictorial block diagram of the gas transport and exchange system in, in the human body. On the right side, you see the red arterial blood, the oxygenated blood, which is coming from the alveolar sacs in the lungs back to the heart and then getting pumped out to uh, the receiving tissue, the interstitial spaces. And there you have another gas exchange going on, <clears throat> oxygen going to uh, the cells, and carbon dioxide coming back into the capillaries. And that then goes up the left side, the deoxygenated blood or venous blood coming back to the heart, which then gets pumped back up to the al alveolar sacs, and where uh, carbon dioxide is emitted and new oxygen comes into the blood. 
So in the lungs, there are millions of tiny sacs called alveoli, which are where the actual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs with capillary blood. Now, the reason there's so many is uh, you will find from the physical laws we discuss later that surface area is a very important qualifier for how much oxygen can get into the bloodstream and how much carbon dioxide can be removed. So this is to give you an idea of how the alveoli are uh, attached to um, the trachea. Uh, there's basically a branching system and we're not going to cover in detail too much of the anatomy of the respiratory system in this lecture because you will find many PowerPoints available on the internet which are basically um, concerned mostly with physiology. It's the physics which seldom is covered as thoroughly mostly because the medical folks aren't physicists by heart. So that is what we as engineers are going to focus on. Just to understand the basic um, structure of the lungs is to create an interface between the very many um, alveoli sacs where the oxygen carbon dioxide gets exchanged and the windpipe airway. So here's another close-up illustration of uh, the alveoli sacs and this is the anatomy we are concerned about is how the actual gas exchange takes place uh, they are like a cluster of grapes and 300 million. Now, 300 million can create 70 square meters of surface area. That's a huge amount of area, and that is the reason for so many of these tiny little sacs. More importantly, their walls, or just as importantly, their walls are only one cell thick. Now, when we discuss Fick's law, you will find that the thickness of the membrane and also its area are the two determinants for how much gas exchange can occur across a surface. So that's the reason for these uh, very small sacs, very thin membranes, and very large area. So when starting any discussion, of gas physics, we're going to start with Boyle's law, which was originally an empirical law, which determines that at any fixed temperature, the relationship between volume and pressure of a gas is inversely proportional. So what it means is if you reduce the volume of a gas by half, and here we see, for instance, the piston being depressed halfway. The white area is cut in half. You can expect the pressure then to be double in the area with half the volume. So Dalton's law is also a critical law for understanding the behavior of mixed gases such as air. And Dalton's law says basically the total pressure of a mixed gas is the sum of the individual pressures of each gas. Now, taken in combination with Boyle's law, what that means is if you double the volume of oxygen in uh, a mixture, then you're going to double the oxygen pressure as well. So the partial pressure of oxygen is increased. And this is the way supplemental oxygen from an oxygen concentrator works when you don't actually pressurize the system. Simply supplying more oxygen will in effect increase the partial pre pressure of oxygen. Henry's law says the amount of gas that gets dissolved into a liquid is proportional to its partial pressure. Now we discussed Dalton's law of partial pressures so we know that the pressure of a gas is the total sum of partial press pressures of the individual components. 
Now, if you were to increase the amount of oxygen by twice in that original composition, then you're also going to be increasing its partial pressure. And so that explains how uh, supplemental oxygen, which increases the volume of oxygen that goes into the lungs, will also increase the partial pressure of oxygen, and that will force more oxygen into the blood. Now we have the special case of um, porters and guides that go to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, where the pressure is about half what it is at sea level, where we're used to breathing. Now, our blood is accommodated to wherever we've been living. We are adaptive, so we can adapt to different altitudes. But when we go up high, the pressure is half of what it is. And what that says is the carbon dioxide is going to come out of the bloodstream very quickly. It also means it's going to be very difficult to get that oxygen, which is at half its normal pressure, into the bloodstream. And what this does is it causes uh, the blood to turn more alkaline, and that can cause an illness called acute mountain sickness, which if it's not treated, which normally it means coming down immediately, can lead to pulmonary edema and to cerebral edema. Now we have the opposite situation for those people who scuba dive. They actually, when they've descended 10 meters under the ocean, they're at double pressure. They're double the atmospheric pressure. And what happens is that the oxygen and nitrogen in their air dissolves into the blood at twice the levels. Now the oxygen gets used up, but when they come up, the nitrogen, which just sits there, if they come up too quickly, that nitrogen can boil out as bubbles and it can potentially be fatal in a disease called the Benz. So we've discussed Boyle's law, which relates pressure and volume at a constant temperature. We've discussed Dalton's law, which describes total pressure as being the sum of partial pressures in a mixture of gases. And we've talked about Henry's law that says the solubility of a gas depends on the pressure or partial pressure. Now we have Graham's law, which also affects gas solubility, but it talks about the rate of diffusion of the gas as opposed to its final concentration. And it says it's proportional to the solubility of that particular gas in the liquid, but also inversely proportional to its molecular mass of that gas constituent. Well, all that really means in our case is that lungs get rid of carbon dioxide almost 20 times faster than the absorbed O2, O2 oxygen because of the difference in uh, solubility and molecular mass. Now Fick's law also describes the osmosis rate or the rate of diffusion and it says the amount of gas that diffuses across the liquid membrane is proportional to the surface area and inversely proportional to the membrane thickness. Now, if you recall, we talked about the alveoli as being very, uh, having an extremely large surface area because of the vast number of them, but also having a very thin monocellular level layer um, of membrane. And that means that they are optimized for Fick's law to get the most amount of gas into and out of the bloodstream. So we've discussed five laws that govern the gas-liquid exchange in the lungs. So now we want to know what are the practical implications for us as biomedical engineers and how do these apply to ventilation and supplemental oxygen? Well, Boyle's law says an increase of lung volume Inhalation will reduce pressure and extract CO2 quickly. Dalton's law says total pressure of a mixed gas is equal to the sum of individual partial pressures, which means we can increase O2 pressure, partial pressure, by adding oxygen in supplemental oxygen. Henry's law says increasing 
the pressure of inhaled air, such as in a CPAP, will increase the amount of oxygen in the blood. Graham's law says that it takes 20 times longer to absorb O2 than to get rid of CO2. And Fick's law says the increases in alveolar wall thickness, inflammation from disease, or reduced alveolar size, such as occurs in pneumonia because of the blocking of so many of alveoli, will reduce the amount of O2 going into the blood and the amount of carbon dioxide coming out. Now, if you look at uh, the illustration, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that noted the alveolar wall is coated with surfactant. Now, surfactant basically means something that reduces uh, surface tension, and we're all familiar with hand soap. That's a surfactant. Well, by reducing uh, surface tension, you actually increase, um, well, by Fick's law, you're actually increasing the amount of gas exchange. And the reason I bring this up is that we're all, we've all heard of COVID-19, and one of the things that it does is it increases um, inflammation, reduces um, the, the, the um, or I should say increases, the film between the gas and the blood as a result of inflammation, and it also attacks the surfactant. So that's an important example of how the physics gets affected by the pathophysiology. Okay, well, here's your assignment. This is a group problem solving and uh, works best if you have two to three people in your small group. And then after you've answered these questions in your small group, choose someone to present them to the larger group for discussion. Uh, and we want to consider how the respiration physics laws apply to pathophysiology and to the medical devices that we are servicing. Um, you know, for instance, CPAP ventilator, oxygen concentrator. And so here are four scenarios to see how well you understand how each of the five laws can impact um, these questions. So uh, give yourself some time and we'll get back to you. Okay, well, I hope you learned a lot from uh, discussing in your small group and that uh, your results presented to the larger group can help. Now, mechanical va ventilation is a very complicated topic that depends on both physics and physiology. And unless you're uh, lucky or unlucky enough to be a designer of mechanical ventilators, you probably won't have to do the mathematics or dig deeply into the pathophysiology. Now realize that <clears throat> the way this can work with respiratory therapists or specialists is they're not actually out there doing complicated comp uh, computations. Uh, in many cases, the ventilators have become so intelligent in terms of um, calculating how to deal with different scenarios that the machine itself is doing all the thinking. And you may encounter, if you get a newer ventilator, something that basically becomes very difficult to diagnose because it does have so much intelligence. But ventilators in general push air oxygen mix into lungs, which are not able to function well enough on their own, supplying oxygen and removing carbon dioxide and um, from the blood by leveraging uh, the gas liquid exchange laws. Physics, our physical and disease effects must be considered in deciding how to set up, uh, how often the breaths are delivered, how large a breath volume should be delivered, how the breath should be triggered, pressure profile, alarms, other concerns. Lung compliance, how flexible is the lung, is one major factor that varies with disease. But as in any complicated uh, task, uh, no one is doing these computations on the fly. There are rules if, uh, if someone is a respiratory therapist is manually setting these things up, 
they have guidelines. Uh, they go according to rote uh, procedure, but they have to know or have a good idea of what the, how the system is compromised in terms of disease. So in summary of our presentation, human lung physiology is optimized for gas liquid exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide under a limited ambient range. Low or high inhalation pressure, altitude, underwater diving, CPAP or ventilation will affect respiration. But fortunately the body is very adaptive so it can change uh, blood, red blood cell count and can compensate over time for most of these ambient effects. So gas liquid exchange laws must be understood for medical device intervention, as well as the pathophysiology of the uh, respiratory impairment. Mechan mechanical ventilation and oxygen therapy requires a firm grasp of physics as well as physiology.